I'm Martha Brumbaugh, and you've already met Debbie Flickinger. And welcome to Arts, Alter Reality to Transform Our Stories, Transformative Art and Storytelling Through the Lens of Feminine Consciousness. We are committed to the belief that all stories are connected. And I'd also like to say that this is, that was wonderful to have Sharon right before us because she touches on a lot of things we talk about. So Debbie, would you take a minute to tell us your story? Gladly, let me begin with a story. My story is a living, breathing story. I will begin with, I was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. My connection to storytelling began in my childhood with family gatherings, with stories of our ancestors and the legacies they have left behind. Each story became a part of my family history and touched me at a deep level of consciousness. This storytelling tradition continues with my family. I have taught doctoral courses on social justice, engaging difference and sustainability through a caring science lens. Moreover, I am a PhD enrollment engagement, engagement specialist. I also facilitate workshops, participate on panels and do presentations on caring sustainability caring science theory, critical race theory, and social justice around the globe. Thank you. I've taught and practiced earth-based spirituality for, I hate to say this, more than five decades. My experience with storytelling stems from my childhood on a small Pennsylvania dairy farm where stories were regularly told by the elders in my family. These oral traditions were passed down through many generations. And now, as shaman and artist, it is storytelling through the lens of the divine feminine that connects me to my work. <clears throat> the purpose today is to intertwine our narrative to unique and individual experience with art as a sacred process and to our research experiences. Our intention is to reveal how stories are transformed by altering realities through the lens of feminine consciousness. The takeaway is to encourage the audience to engage in storytelling as a call to action for personal and social change, as well as enlightenment. Debbie, I know you have a strong connection to your writing and poetry. Can you tell us about it? First, let me say that for me, it is the art of writing that speaks to my soul. In November, I went to Minneapolis to present at the National Women's Studies Association, NWSA, everyone uses acronyms now, conference. I felt a strong sense of the divine, of the feminine, to visit the George Floyd Memorial. In that brief experience, reality shifted for me and altered my consciousness. When I returned, I penned this poem, which has been, has become part of a living narrative. An ode to George Floyd. Stepping out of the car into the misty fall air, a wave of emotions rolled over me. At the corner of Chicago and East 38th in Minneapolis is now sacred ground where George Floyd was cruelly killed. There was the scent of both fresh and wilted flowers. I could feel his spirit surrounding me. The store stands like a backdrop for a massive altar on the paved street. I went there to pay my respects and to honor George Floyd. What I did not, what I did not expect was the powerful energy of the place, not spiteful or hateful, but filled with forgiveness. It is resistant to the wind, rain, sleet, ice, or snow that falls in Minneapolis. The power of place forever lingers. Ever so, I dared not go into the little cup food store. The fear of becoming another sadistic welled up inside me. Floyd's last words, mama, I can't breathe. 
echoed through my heart and soul. Tears flowed from my eyes as I remembered May 25th, 2020, when he succumbed to his death under the knee of the white police officer. Why is there so much violence and hatred directed at the black community? How can we continue to live without harmony and caring? As I stepped out of that reality and stepped back into the car, I knew those two questions would most likely haunt me for the rest of my life. The poem ended, but in my heart, I knew that the living narrative would pull me deeper into my own exploration of the divine feminine. And it would continue to open up to a much more profound understanding of feminine consciousness. Perhaps it is the chaos if the, of the world around us that creates our stories and shapes the reality in which we live. Thank you, Debbie. It's always astounding to hear your stories, your experiences and your life writing. I admire also your willingness to ask the hard questions to surrender to, as well as to dive into the unoften or the often uncharted waters in which we swim. I'm reminded that the late scholar and shaman Maladoma Somme said, without stories, society will find it difficult to hold itself together. It's as if stories bond people together and allow each individual to better comprehend their place in the world and how their place holds everything else together. Indigenous teachings are derived from stories that they see as eternal blueprints for human wisdom. Martha, I'm convinced that without storytelling incorporated in our work, that we would not be able to sustain the holistic and living activities that invite sharing with others and includes loving kindness, gratitude, forgiveness, and appreciation of self, others, and Mother Earth. These components all have a lasting impact on our hearts. In turn, we help to create a shift or transformation in the communities we touch. We know that few people want to venture out of their comfort zone, as Carolyn Miss suggests, and is hard to get the focus from me to us. Storytelling breaks down those barriers and helps us to become advocates for one another. I think that it also requires a shift in one's consciousness and even one's reality to make that happen. I know that you are always bringing reality into our conversations. Can you share with us how that manifests itself in your life and in our work? Well, I have spent much of my life pondering the question, what is real? That led me to further questions about the nature of consciousness as it pertains to reality, and in turn, how both might shape the transformative processes of not only storytelling, but visual and performance art. I couldn't connect the dots until one day a colleague introduced me to, to the divine, introduced the divine feminine into our conversation. The, it was in that moment I realized that consciousness, as Leslie Combs wrote in Consciousness Explained Better, is the background or simply the ground of all experience. But what about feminine consciousness? Where does that creative spark ignite? For me, creativity and transformation leap out at us from the divine feminine. Even science requires a sense of the feminine. The divine feminine and consciousness are inseparable in our work. We acknowledge the importance of scientific research, but the focus on the more mysterious, hidden, and unquantifiable expressions of consciousness are what really intrigue us. Since storytelling is crucial to our work, I will share with you one of my experiences that seems in retrospect to have been the transformative moment that brought me back to my work as an artist and writer, not to mention a step into a completely different reality. It was a warm summer evening west of Petaluma, California, and we were gathered in an apple orchard. In the middle of the clearing burned a 10 by 10 bed of fire that was ready to be raked into 1,250 degree coals. 
I remember that we chanted and drummed that we could be one with the fire. And soon it was ready. And the experienced women began to dance their way into the coals. One by one, more women made their way across the fire, dancing and singing and laughing. And oh, I wanted so badly to do that. But the several times I was nearly ready to step out, I felt a distinct tug on the back of my collar. A voice, a man's voice, said, not yet. I recognized the voice as my father's. I stood transfixed until a woman standing in the coals took my hand and said, I know you can do this. The next thing I knew I was on the other side, convinced that I'd walked around the coals and not in them. The hard evidence was on my blackened feet, not charred, not burned, but covered with warm charcoal. To this day, I don't know what happened. I was in a different realm of consciousness. I do not even know if the woman was real, nor why my father knew that I needed to wait for her. I returned home the next day with a new sense of determination and possibility, got out my pens and pad and began to draw. I overnight had shifted from someone who was feeling lost to a woman who had reclaimed her connection to the divine feminine and her own inner power. Peter Kingsley in his book, Reality, tells us that sometimes in trying to find new evidence, we must surrender to the proverbial river, which is a symbol of the divine feminine. And I quote, it is utterly useless to sit and watch the evidence as if we are on the banks of a river. That will get us nowhere. We just have to throw ourselves into the river and let it take us wherever it leads. Debbie and I surrender to that process every time we work together. And I'm not hesitant to say that I perceive this as a magical and alchemical process. So Debbie, what are your thoughts on, on that? Martha, your story aligns with what Shar Sharmer's book, Theory You, leading from the future as it emerge, emerges, when he proclaimed that I think it is now time for social scientists to step out of the shadow and to establish an advanced social sciences methodology that integrates science, third person view, social transformation, second person view, and the evolution of self, first person view, into a coherent framework of consciousness, story-based research. You told your story, which is a personal narrative, that connected you with the divine feminine. Jean Watson, a scholar, healer, and creator of the caring science theory, believes that it begins with the heart. We encourage all of you to engage in storytelling, whether as a call to action for personal and social change, scientific discovery, or as a journey to enlightenment. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you all for being with us this morning. We hope we've given you some food for thought. By the way, we're presenting at the follower conference, the followership conference in Newport Beach, Virginia in March. Now, if you have any questions and if we have any time left, which I think we do, um, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Just raise your hand if you can. Okay, great. Yeah, we've got a lot of time for questions and conversation and whatever else. So uh, we'll let you guys manage it with the hand raises. You're all good at that. So take it away. Jeffrey, how do we see everybody? I only see the first screen of people. Uh, I would pop up the participants panel. Okay. If I were you, and then you can see. But also, the first screen of people, when someone raises their hand, it should pop up right in the top left corner. Oh, okay. Cool. So that's kind of handy, too. But I like to look at both just to make sure nothing's being missed. Sometimes Zoom is a little, a little wonky. And if you don't have questions, that's fine, too. And if you have tough questions, that's wonderful. <laughs> We may not have answers, but we'll try. Can I ask a question? 
Yes. I, I, I'm having a hard time raising the hand with the, I'm on the phone calling from the phone. Oh, that's oh, fine. Yeah. Good call. <laughs> no worries. Please do. I just joined you guys. And the last couple of things you said resonate, resonated with me and the work I do. I, um, I basically educate uh, the communi communities uh, about healing through love and uh, a spirit called Ubuntu from Africa uh, mm -hmm. through storytelling. We do a lot of storytelling. And I was like, wow, I missed the whole thing. Is there a way to see what you guys were talking about earlier? Are you going to share this recording uh, with all of us? I'm so sorry. I joined late. My brother sent me this link and I just saw it and I was like, let me hop on. But I needed to hear that sentence to ask this question. Thank you. I believe, Jeffrey, the, the, the recordings will be shared later, right? They should be up on the Society YouTube channel, the ones that uh, people are okay with having shared, uh, which isn't okay. all of them. So uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll get to that and get that up sometime this coming week. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie's got a uh, his hand up. Oh, Leslie, sorry, I didn't see that. You have to unmute yourself, Leslie. Could tell my wife that. Um, anyway, <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for an excellent presentation. I uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, I was impressed with how you brought together the themes of, uh, of uh, narrative, uh, gender, and also some fairly uh, formal uh, consciousness studies written by yours truly. Uh, so, thank you for the uh, for the gift of your presentation. Well, thank you for being here <laughs> and listening. I know it's such a joy to be here again, another year with all of you. Yeah. Hillary, I too would like to thank you very much for your presentation, but I think I have sort of a tough question because it's what okay. I'm asking myself. And that is that, um, you know, as a woman, I have, again, five decades of working in this realm and change, uh, strategic change, and, and, and the storytelling plays an am amazing role in that. But there's a new narrative that is unfortunately forming right now, and I call it the sleeping princes. Mm -hmm. And it's young men who are, are, are getting very lost mm -hmm. and that uh, can't find their way through, uh, through a lot of the of 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 the hate and the and the and more the more the, the the depression around where do I fit? I don't know where I fit. I don't see a place for myself. I don't know where I belong. Many of them are getting like my son diagnosed with schizophrenia because they see the world in a different way and have been traumatized by mental health systems. So so um, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are as from the feminist perspective. And from the work that you do, how do we help these sleeping princes? Can I just make one suggestion? I believe it starts with dialogue, conversation, town hall meetings, if you will. You know, even small gatherings to speak about exactly what you're talking about. If we sit as those silent people and don't become advocates for our community, you're right, we get nowhere. It's a hard question, Laurel, it's a tough question. And my work is to just keep dialogue going, <laughs> keep some type of storytelling going because it is, in my view, a call to action for all of us. Michelle Obama says, own your story. Your story is who you are. And once our young males, you know, start to think about who they are, not worry so much about fitting in because we all come in this world, I believe with unique gifts. And it's a good thing to find out who we are, you know? So anyway, that's what I'm thinking about. I hope it doesn't exactly answer your question, but it invites more dialogue about your question. I mean, I would be interested in giving a workshop with you, Laurel, on that question. And we put, if it's Zoom, we could put people in breakout rooms and we could come up with 
some of this um, fascinating um, storytelling. So Hillary, I'm going to segue from that and say that um, we, I have, I'm a mother of two boys and they're 37 and 35 anyhow. And I raised them in earth-based spirituality and sham, shamanic traditions. Mm -hmm. So when they hit their mid twenties, actually even earlier than that, maybe late teens, my older son just threw away everything. And he was interested in the things that young men want money and, you know, in his case, family. And, and he has gone, I would say off the path, off my path. And the ironic thing is that now I live with him <laughs> and my daughter-in-law and two grandchildren. And I think that the best way to approach it is to set, set an example. Mm -hmm give reminders constantly. And I know that's hard to do because not everybody has that privilege of living with their kids. But if, if we can really reach them at a deeper level, then things can change and shift. And I think they will. I'm not saying that it's easy. And I think Debbie's idea about doing a workshop possibly on this sort of thing would be great, but then how do we get the young men to turn up? Well, well, actually I'm asking the question too, because I am trying to go by example and I'm launching a worldwide event next year based on Alice in Wonderland. It's called wow. Taste of Wonderland that will have the same process of discovery in seven different cities around the world on the same day to explore how do, what kind of world do we want to co-create? Mm -hmm. And what kind of and stop getting out of the language of mental health and schizophrenia and all these terms. And I thank you all the wonderful suggestions in the chat I have looked at and done. And that's informed my des desire to actually create a very different kind of conversation, one which co-create using Alice in Wonderland as the as a template. And so that narrative lends itself to the world turning upside down. But I would love to talk to you more about that process and how, how you might wish to inform what I'm doing. So uh, I will be reaching out and I thank you very much for your work. Laurel, can I say something to you? I'm working with a student right now that is, her dissertation is about Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> she wrote some papers, you know, before and I said, you know, this could be a dissertation. There's so many, you know, things within, th so many themes within that uh, story. So yeah, thank you, Laurel, for saying that. Thank you. So um, I think the next person is Laurel. Thank you. <clears throat> I very much appreciated hearing what you had to say. And the focus of my work throughout my life has been the story pre-written into the English language on the level of puns and the symbols of the alphabet. And I actually wrote what I call my fairyography, which is about an elemental being who goes through the looking glass into this dimension and has to deconstruct the language to find her way back home again. And, um, Somewhere on page one, she says, I was born in upside down town to the king and queen of backward land. I spoke a foreign language, which they had to twist to understand. The king was sowing sorrow and the queen was reaping grief. I held my dreams, but lost my way, confused beyond belief. So in terms of owning your story. Um, you, my, I have a viral video called The Secret Spells of the English Language, which talk, it's on YouTube. I posted it in 2010. And 
the uh, I describe it as our premier life sentence, which is that we awake each morning and go off through the weekdays to earn our living at various jobs and undertakings until we come to the weekend. And my special gift has been to translate the English language, T-R-A-N-C-E. And when you translate that life sentence, you remember that a wake is a funeral party for the dead. Mourning is the state you're in when you attend a wake. You'd have to be staggering around in a week days to earn the living since urns are for the ashes of the dead. We call our jobs undertakings. Job itself is a Hebrew word for persecuted. And what we get at the end of this perverse bargain with life is the weekend of the deal. And our most frequent greeting to each other is hello. And the reverse of it is oh hell. So my recognition is that in all our efforts to heal our psyches and raise consciousness on the planet, we've all but overlooked the very instrument of conscious thought and communication. But our forked tongue English language, which is the leading software of the Western mind, is itself in great need of retuning and upgrading. So when I asked a group of people once, what will we do with hello? And she, being a midwife, said, how about hello? So a lot of people around the world have created Grand Rising. My vision is to help create a new word order in which we collectively, creatively upgrade English to facilitate our essential evolution from humankind to human kindness. Mm. So that's where I play. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. That's fascinating. And it seems like several of us have a lot of things in common. I see a question here from somebody to ask me, what is earth-based spirituality? And earth-based spirituality is, uh, it's not, it's a path. I'm not going to say it's a religion because it's not, but it's a path to wholeness by honoring the earth, the animals, humans, and the world we live in. And yes, I would agree with your question that there is a space-based spirituality. Um, Sandra got into that a little bit with a conversation about science fiction and aliens. And I don't know, I mean, we're, we have to be aware of not just the earth, but of space too. And that's from an environmental standpoint because we're dumping all our garbage into space these days. And what's that doing to that environment? What is that doing to the possibility of life on other planets? Um, so Earth-based spirituality started out a long time ago as just, I guess it was based on Wicca and witchcraft. And I hesitate to use those terms today because people cringe. And the indigenous peoples also celebrate and honor the earth. And all of us are indigenous to some place. We, our ancestors came from various places on the earth. And so the term indigenous to me is wider based than the tribes of North America or South America. Um, because that's just the way it, I think it is. And the thing that connects all those peoples, all our ancestors, is the drum, the heartbeat of the drum. But so much for that. I hope that helped you with your question. Um, but does anybody else have something? And, and did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. I think it did. So if... About anybody, another minute, folks. Okay. So if anybody's got something. There should be... Um, a link to a handout. I think Debbie said that at the beginning. Yeah, and I believe that again. Okay, there it is. And this has on some definitions that we created for the work we do, a bibliography of books that you might be interested in, not all of them, but a few. And it has a photograph of my collage work that I do. I put pulled a lot of my collages and put it into one picture 
So you can see some of the work I do if you open that up, or if you just open up the, hand, the handout. So again, Debbie, did you have some last words? No, I just am so, um, you know, I've got, I'm just so happy to be here and I thank everyone for being here. The questions, the what's in the chat, you know, the thing I like about philosophy is there's no right or wrong answer. It's just open to interpret and share what we want people to contribute or collaborate. And so anyway, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. And our emails are on that handout. And I would be delighted to hear from some of you by email. And I know Debbie would be too. And I just wanted to say to okay. Sharon, because I couldn't get my hand up, Jeffrey, just one second. Thank you for your presentation, Sharon. I did my master's project on the television show Northern Exposure and oh. looked at the consciousness and the Jungian stories throughout that. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.